Hi everyone, Liz Collin here. Welcome to Liz Collin Reports, a place for truth and meaningful Minnesota conversations. On the podcast today, we have attorney James Dickey of the Upper Midwest Law Center in studio. Thank you so much for being here, James. Good to see you. Thank you, Liz. Nice to be here. And you are coming off a big win at the Minnesota Supreme Court last week, dealing with the hiring of Minneapolis police officers. But let's catch our listeners and our viewers up, up to speed about, about what happened, because this is a pretty monumental day. It really was. It was a huge win for the people of Minneapolis. And what the Supreme Court essentially did here was say that Mayor Fry has to have at least 0.0017 police officers per resident in Minneapolis on the police force. And that translates to 731 in 2020 numbers. And the next date you're looking at is August 1st. But what will now happen? This is basically kicking the issue back to the lower court. Exactly. So the Supreme Court said that the district court had originally properly issued the writ of mandamus, forcing Mayor Fry to actually have that number of police on the force. And so now the district court is has required Mayor Fry to actually show cause as to why the Minneapolis police force is below that number. So you're going to be going up against the city of Minneapolis, and there will be arguments here on, on both sides. What are we doing uh, to hire police officers, and and what are we not doing, essentially? Exactly. So the city will present their evidence as to what they have done. They, they could they can technically get off the hook, so to speak, if they can show that they have a valid excuse for not complying with the writ of mandamus. But they have to come forward with evidence to show that. They have to show why it is that they have not been able to hire enough officers, including what efforts that they have made and such. Uh, and at the same time, we will be able to present evidence, cross-examine their witnesses, including probably Mayor Fry, and also present our own evidence that the Minneapolis Police Department and the city, and specifically Mayor Fry, haven't done everything that they can. These are really eye-opening numbers, too. The Minneapolis Police Force had 910 police officers uh, just three years ago, th this month, if you will, um, and the city charter is calling for 731. As a minimum, right. I mean, there, you know, and I think that it's pretty clear that Minneapolis likely needs more police officers than that from just a policy standpoint. But, you know, from our perspective as the lawyers, what we're tr simply trying to do here is enforce the minimum. And somehow Minneapolis has gotten even below that. And give us a little bit more background on these uh, eight residents who came forward and said that the city isn't safe. We need to, to do something about it. It took some courage for them to, to step forward and, and be on that side, if you will. I'm not even sure if all these residents still live in Minneapolis because of everything that, that has played out. But how are they feeling about this issue at this point? Well, they're, first of all, really happy about this victory in the Supreme Court. Um, this vindicates the two and a half years of effort on their part to get to this point. Uh, and specifically related to uh, them fighting back against what has been this movement towards defunding. Um, they recognize, they are, they, they are eight residents of the north side of Minneapolis, and they recognize the need for a police component on the streets of North Minneapolis in the 4th Precinct to ensure that there are deterrents in effect against the criminal element there. We've heard that the police force has lost about a third of, of its officers. It seems to fluctuate around that 600 number. It's kind of even hard to, for, I'm sure, you guys to get at a, a, an actual number. Well, you know, it's funny you say that because when we, uh, when we originally um, uh, got the writ of mandamus, uh, the police force had projected that they were going to continue to, to decline. And it turned out that public reports actually show they declined even further below what their ro rosy projections had actually indicated. And by rosy, I mean still illegal and below the charter, but higher than what they actually end up having. Um, and it looks to us that uh, based on the last um, submission to the court by the city, to the Supreme Court, um, the city had about 610 officers, and I think 39 of those were still on continuous leave. Uh, and the most recent reports I've seen indicate somewhere around 620. But again, with 40 officers on continuous leave, you have an effective component of only 580 or so officers. So this is all well and good, um, but who wants to be a, a Minneapolis mm -hmm. police officer and still the city council? Some are still calling for the, the police to be defunded that are current uh, city council members. So you expect some of these issues to come up in court? I do think they will come up in court. And, you know, the, the, the Supreme Court held that the city council had provided enough funding, at least on their budget documents, to satisfy the uh, requirements under the city charter. Um, but I do wonder, you know, to the extent to which Mayor Fry and others will testify that the money that they currently have is not enough to entice officers to come to Minneapolis. And if that's the case, then I think the city council is not done here. Um, so, you know, to, to some degree, what we're going to see in, on August 1st in this hearing is going to be about what efforts 
have been made and what more could have been done in the city of Minneapolis to hire more police officers. And is that the point in a way this is really an unprecedented case uh, we're seeing play out um, in, in Minneapolis, but other cities can then look look to this and the hope is that this isn't allowed to happen again. Right. I mean, other cities have every right and ability to pass a uh, charter amendment similar to what Minneapolis did in 1961, by the way, uh, in creating this minimum police force requirement. That can be a bulwark against police defunding. And our state legislators also have the opportunity at any time that they want they could pass, for example, a law that requires that every city of the first class in, in Minnesota, you know, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Duluth, uh, and uh, Rochester, that they also have a minimum police component, just like Minneapolis does. So there are different things that individual citizens can do and legislators can do to address these threats of police defunding. A case that so many people are watching. We obviously wish you the, the best of luck come, come August 1st. Thank you. I know Upper Midwest Law Center is in the middle of several big cases that you're going to provide uh, updates on, but let's go back, rewind a bit to the pandemic and seeking damages um, from some of the decisions that were made by Governor Tim Walz at that time. Yeah, so we originally filed a lawsuit in May of 2020 uh, against Governor Walz's selective shutdowns of businesses and churches in Minnesota. And, you know, at that time, there was kind of a groundswell of opinion realizing, hey, this is really bad. This is not what's supposed to happen in good government. And this is trampling on the rights of individual citizens. But it wasn't always so popular, you know, right when the, uh, the pandemic started happening. And so we filed that lawsuit. And actually, about a year after we filed the lawsuit, the uh, district court, the federal district of Minnesota, delivered us a big victory and said that churches actually cannot be discriminated against and said that the, the government's actions related to churches would be subject to the strictest scrutiny under the Constitution, under the First Amendment. And as a result of that, we immediately entered into a settlement agreement with Governor Walls, where he agreed that going forward, he would not treat churches and place, other places of worship in Minnesota any worse than the least restricted secular business. So to put that in layman's terms, if Target is open, your church has to be open, and that's because of the settlement that we obtained on behalf of our clients. And then the district court disagreed with us on whether businesses could get damages for um, Governor Wall shutting them down for two months. So we disagree, we think that's wrong, we appealed to the Eighth Circuit. They affirmed the district court, but they did so on kind of technical legal grounds. So we're currently seeking a rehearing from the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, and we're hoping that the entire Eighth Circuit, uh, the entire composition of the court will overturn that and allow uh, Governor Walls to be held individually responsible for these damages. And these are two churches and three businesses that are right. part of this? Right. And the two churches have settled their portion of the claim because Governor Walls agreed not to discriminate against them anymore, which is the whole point of the lawsuit for them. And so we got a complete victory. And then with the businesses, there's three businesses and their owners who are our clients. I know you're also involved with a lawsuit against the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and this involves the California CARS rule that has been making news as of late. That's right. So we are representing the Minnesota Automobile Dealers Association in their lawsuit against the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And the point of the lawsuit is that Minnesota is not California, and Minnesota and Minnesotans themselves have sovereignty in this state, and they cannot be required by the MPCA to give that sovereignty to the California Air Resources Board. So we sued the MPCA because the rule as it stands allows for whenever California makes a rule change is automatically imported into Minnesota related to cars and, uh, and into their emissions. And we think that's simply a, a violation of Minnesota sovereignty. You're saying the air quality in California is different than what we experience in Minnesota. It absolutely is. And in fact, part of our claim is that essentially what the MPCA has done for years now is to keep these uh, so-called maintenance programs in place that are not actually related to any greenhouse gases, which are what the rules uh, seek to regulate. And the problem with that is that that allows them so under their theory, to access the California waiver to make Minnesota's rules the same as California's for cars. But Minnesota is not California. The only uh, active non-attainment area, as it's called under federal law, was in Egan related to lead for beginning in 2008. They've already at attained compliance. There is no area in Minnesota that is not in compliance with federal, federal air quality standards. So Minnesota doesn't need California car rules. And you're also pointing out this supply and demand situation that the demand just isn't here. And that's exactly right. Our clients uh, have pointed out in the petition uh, that they file with the Court of Appeals that 
you know, this is just not right, that they should be forced to essentially purchase a fleet of vehicles from a manufacturer that there's no demand for in Minnesota. Another case with elections just around the corner that's uh, quite topical as well, the ongoing challenge to the Secretary of State's absentee ballot processing rules. So this is a case where you're trying to clear up that confusion confusion, because there is uh, quite a bit of it. Right. And, you know, under Minnesota state law, um, absentee ballot boards are what get all your absentee ballots, and then they analyze whether or not the ballot should be accepted or rejected. They don't actually see who you voted for or anything like that in this first analysis. All they see is that there is a person who applied, they signed the application, and there's a person who returned the ballot with the same identification number, theoretically, and then they also sign that that, that return envelope. And so... What the, what the Secretary of State has done is created a rule that make, turns that into an absolute mess. Um, whereas the statute says that the, the uh, judges have to know whether the voter signed it, the Secretary of State is arguing that all there has to be is a signature on paper, no matter who mm-hmm. signed it. And that just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't stand to reason. So we brought this lawsuit along with Minnesota Voters Alliance against the Secretary of State. Uh, it's now already been argued in the Court of Appeals, and we're waiting for a decision from the court. Timeline-wise, do you expect this to be sorted out in time for November? Yes. The Court of Appeals has a 90-day uh, deadline. We, this is argued on June 9th, so we expect by beginning of September that we will have a decision from the Court of Appeals, at least, as to whether or not this rule complies with uh, the requirements for rulemaking in Minnesota. I know there are quite a few cases uh, that to talk about yet, but we'll have you back uh, to do that. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Liz. Really appreciate your time. Great to see you. Again, James Dickey with the Upper Midwest Law Center. We will see you next time. Thank you. And that will do it for this episode of Liz Collin Reports. We'll be back again soon. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify or any other podcast platform, and be sure to sign up for our free daily newsletter on alphanews.org. We'll see you next time.